Greetings everyone, welcome to the lecture on evolution of art in Mauryan and post Mauryan period. Presently, we are discussing the importance of different kind of architectural developments like construction of pillars, caves, stupas, etc. during the Mauryan period. So, carrying forward our discussion on caves, the Barabar caves are the oldest surviving rock cut caves in India, mostly dated during the Mauryan period and some also with Ashokan inscriptions. Located in the Jehanabad district of Bihar. These caves are situated in the twin hills of Barabar. There were almost four caves. Uh, the Nagarjuna cave is an important archaeological site located on the Nagarjuni hills around 41 km from Bodh Gaya. It consists of three caves, namely Gopi cave, Mirza Mandi and Vedahika Kubha. Buddhist religious principles were practiced here and many important details pertaining to Buddhism and the philosophy can be studied from the various uh, kind of forms that have been unearthed here. Now, talking about stupas, the great stupa at Sanchi was originally commissioned by Ashoka during the 3rd century BCE. Its nucleus was a simple hemispherical brick structure that was built over the relics of Buddha. It was crowned by the Chhatra which was intended to honor and shelter the relics. Then another very example, a very important example of stupa that can be discussed is Dhamek stupa at Sarnath, which is a very prominent Buddhist structure in India. Again, it was constructed under the patronage of Ashoka. Dhamek stupa, uh, stupa specifically bears a significance at Sarnath as it signifies the seat of the holy Buddha as he proclaimed his faith. And Buddhist pilgrims belonging to different countries visit this place for the sacred stupa and also to offer worship to Buddha. Talking about the relevance of pillars, the pillars of Ashoka were a series of columns that were not located only at a few sites, but they were dispersed throughout the northern Indian subcontinent, erected or at least inscribed by the Mauryan king Ashoka during his reign in the 3rd century BCE. Originally, there must have been many more pillars, but only 19 survive with inscriptions and many are preserved in a fragmentary state. So, if we talk about the average height of these pillars, it was probably 40 and 50 feet and they weighed around 50 tons and all the pillars were quarried at Chunar which was south of Varanasi and then they were probably dragged hundreds of miles away to their final destination where they were erected. And it is definitely a marvel and uh, it needs lot of retrospection uh, to inquire as to how they were transported during that period. An Ashokan pillar across from a stupa at Kolhua near Vaishali in Bihar is also very significant. The pillars of Ashoka bear inscriptions in Brahmi script, however, in the northwestern region, uh, this was not the norm. Alexander Cunningham was the first to study the inscriptions on the pillars. Now, if we talk about the sculptures that evolved during this period, then one can say that the sculptures are the artistic expressions which reflect different cultural traits. Indian subcontinent has had a rich tradition of sculptural art that dates back to the Neolithic period, though archaeologically a continuous trajectory of evolution of sculpture 
can be traced from 3rd century BCE onwards. There is a need to understand the Shilpa Shastrik normative tradition and identify the different schools of art in early India. So, sculpture has been categorized into different schools of art, for example, the Gandhara school of art, Mathura school of art, Amravati school of art. An important archaeological evidence of sculptural art in India refers to the images of mother goddesses and the remarkable example of sculpture from Harappan civilization comes in the form of the dancing girl from Mohanjodaro in addition to a number of other examples like the priest king and so on. So, references to the existence of sacred sculptures antedates the material evidence. Early texts call images like Pratima, Sandarshi, Prakriti or Bimb which later came to denote uh, religious objects of worship. The earliest reference to the attributes of gods comes from the Vedic period where we have word pictures of different deities such as that of Shri in the Shri Sukta though it is not archaeologically proved. Panini, a grammarian belonging to the 6th century BCE, however, has referred to the existence as well as rituals surrounding a prakriti or an image. Similarly, Saunaka in his digest Brihat Devata refers to 10 essential elements that help us identify a deity such as form, relationship, emblem, vehicle, name, attribute, symbol, expression of the face, etc. Then uh, the Griha Sutras were unequivocal in the recognition of Pratima of icons and the domestic rituals involved in their worship. So, we see that by the time Bhakti emerged, uh, it came to have specific impact on sculptures. Creation of images came into prominence with the popularization of the cult of Bhakti as a religious doctrine amongst all sects, whether it was Buddhism, Jainism, Shaivism or Vishnuism. So, the personal bond between the devotee and the Isht Devata or the personal god through the offering of obeisance, puja and archana required a direct and identifiable object of worship and hence uh, the practice of making such sculptures which were representing specific deities, gods and goddesses became the practice. Now, this also led to the creation of anthropomorphic images as well as shrines to keep such images. Another impetus was the worship of popular spirits, for example, yakshas, vrikshas or trees and water or forces of nature along with funerary remains of uh, great men like Buddha and Mahavira and also their main disciples. So, the practice of preserving relics of uh, these holy men also created a need to create structures where such relics could be adequately placed. Then another reason uh, why sculptures, uh, sculpture making got a boost was the word images of deities that had been mentioned in Vedic chants uh, that were translated into sculptures of various sectarian gods. The Buddhists initiated the rock cut caves. Hindus and Jains also started to imitate them at Badami, Aihol, Elora, Salset, Elephanta, Aurangabad and Mahabalipuram. So, the rock cut art continuously evolved over a period of time 
सिंस दी फर्स्ट रॉक कट केव्स ऑफ बराबर इन बिहार सो इट वॉज नॉट एज इफ रॉक कट केव आर्किटेक्चर कैन बी डेजिग्नेटेड to a particular religion or to a particular ruler or a specific area there was continuous ev- uh, evolution as well as the uh, uh, continuity the tradition of continuity that was very important the lively traditions of indian sculpture date back to the first indian empire that was the mauryan dynasty now uh, if we talk about early buddhist mauryan sculptures then sculptors began to carve characters and scenes from the stories of india's three interconnected religions that was hinduism buddhism and jainism the evidence from early buddhist mauryan sculptures sheds some more interesting light on the convention of conceiving these divine figures of yakshas in human form so it was not as if yakshas were considered only as the other worldly so while they were other worldly creatures they were becoming part of the overall religious tradition the buddha whose presence on the piece of cloth was indicated by his footprints so this was also an important feature of early sculpture that it was not the human form that came into being rather there was use of signs and symbols so apart from rock cut caves stupas and viharas pillars and monumental figures sculptures were carved at several places in india the mauryan pillars were rock cut and inscribed therefore the carver's skill can clearly be seen the vigorous figures were carved on top of the pillars some of the visuals have already been shared the lion capital from sarnath is one of the finest representatives of modern art uh, of mauryan art a life size standing image of a yakshini holding a fly whisk or a chauri was another such example the beauty of this image was such that it had to be carved in a uh, well proportioned manner and the smooth surface of this uh, image further shows the level of sophistication that had been attained both in the form as well as in the medium so if we talk about uh, the period from the second uh, century uh, bce to the first century uh, and, and we refer to the sunga andhra uh, period then this was one of the most important creative periods of buddhist art though the sunga rulers were followers of brahmanism yet they were moderate towards buddhism and there was no setback in the propagation or popularity of the buddhist faith which is also proven from the fact that so many sculptures uh, pertaining to this religion are found several buddhist establishments flourished in bodh gaya bharhut and sanchi in northern and central india in amravati and jagayapita in south india at bhaja nasik karle and at several other places in western india so we see that art was getting fairly widespread the art of this period consisted mainly in the excavation of the rock cut caves or viharas some of which are embellished with paintings and the erection of uh, railings toranas which were gateways uh, to the buddhist stupas at different places so we see that some very important additions were being made in the form of torans and railings which became very important part of these viharas in the early centuries hindu and buddhist art 
fell within the same tradition that is the magnificent Buddhist carvings on the great stupa at Sanchi uh, uh, bear great re re resemblance to other religious traditions also. While Buddhist sculpture acquired a character of its own when the religion moved outwards from India to the northwest. The Buddha Charita which was uh, composed around early 2nd century CE sung in the canonical literature is a popular subject for narrative Buddha panels in Gandhara region also which again indicates the kind of uh, regional spread that was emerging in sculptural forms. Another important point that needs to be kept in mind is the relevance of symbol. While in all the scenes depicting the different incidents in the life of Buddha, his presence is suggested symbolically either with the foot footprints, the parasol and the fly whisks or the wheel and also the people tree. So, it depends on the eye of uh, or the gaze uh, as to how you perceive a particular subject matter. Uh, for example, Buddha's mother sportively blends the branch of the shawl tree. The child Buddha coming out from her side is held wrapped in a cloth by an attendant standing by her side. So, the use of shawl tree bending of the branch and also wrapping in a cloth uh, is was indicative of Buddha. The presence of the divine Buddha is suggested by the footprints on the cloth that was held by them and it is indeed a marvel as to how such details are visible even in the stone traditions that is sculpture. Uh, so, uh, if we talk about the pre Kushana tradition then the lively traditions of Indian sculpture definitely date back to the first Indian empire of the Mauryan dynasty, but then going forward there was no looking back. Sculptors began to carve characters and scenes from the stories of India's uh, religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and uh, the evidence from uh, uh, early Buddhist Mauryan sculptures sheds very important light on the convention of depicting divine figures of yakshas in human form. Apart from rock cut caves, stupas, viharas, pillars, uh, these were uh, uh, definitely uh, there was definitely now a more focus as to and it was not as if viharas were uh, plain assembly halls they were also kind of some viharas were decorated with paintings and also with sculptures. Life size standing image of a yakshini holding a fly whisk has been described as a very important example of art during this period and as you can see in this visual the kind of shine and the, the huge structure conveyed a definite impact and this shine could have been achieved with lot of finesse and perfection. And as you can see in this visual, the kind of carving, the details speak volumes about the perfection that had been attained by the artists, but it also indicates some kind of influence of Greco Roman art forms as the kind of folds and floral patterns that were found on the pillars on the abacus or the capitals clearly indicate that there was lot of evolution that was happening in art forms. So, the Mauryan pillars capitals were not plain and simple. The abacus was highly ornamented with floral and animated motifs. Another very important example was the fluted petals as you can see in this visual. 
the petals are clearly visible in the fluted form and this of course is the example of Mauryan capitals, the Ram Purva Bull from Bihar and Sarnath lines. As you can see the detail of abacus and the shape of inverted lotus is clearly visible and the importance of fluted petals is not to be missed. As you can see at the bottom in both the sculptures. Now coming to the next stage of evolution of art form that was Gandhara art. So during the reign of Kushans, India's most important styles in sculptures developed. It was between the 2nd and the 5th century CE that Gandhara and Mathura art came into existence as separate identity but again we cannot say that they were completely opposite there were a lot of similarities also if we talk about gandhara art then gandhara art mainly contains sculptures those uh, de which deal with the images of buddha from the earliest period this art is named as gandhara art after the region of Gandhar which is the place uh, now in Pakistan from where such sculptures were discovered. However, Gandhara art is not to be seen uh, on its own because the pre-Gandhara style that had emerged had a very important influence and a very important uh, uh, feature of the pre-Gandhara art was Buddha's presence primarily through symbols that I have just explained in the form of a cloth or in the form of footprints or a lotus. So it can be seen that the Gandhara style was tremendously influenced also by Hellenistic art which, which originated in Greco-Roman world around 2nd century and it was seen that it was highly influential in the countries from Central and Eastern Asia. So the Kushana period uh, that was marked by imperialism uh, conveyed the importance of a huge region uh, that covered present day Afghanistan, Northwest Pakistan, Northwestern India. So definitely this entire region became uh, the center for Gandhara art and the rise and growth of the Kushans as a political power uh, around 1st century to 3rd century CE also coincided with a great cultural ferment in the region. So the age of maturity in Indian classical art began during the Kushana period. So Kanishka who was the third member in the Kushana royal line developed the empire to its fullest extent and was a great patron of Buddhist religion. So it was under him that Buddhist art produced uh, significant uh, sculptural forms and the kind of uh, images that were uh, coming up uh, not only captured a sense of uh, his uh, uh, worship uh, but also the kind of regional uh, diversity that was being promoted. Uh, so sculpture or any kind of art form promotes and strengthens the creative faculty and it also continued to act as a great source of inspiration both for the patron as well as for the artist. Coming from varied backgrounds, styles, schools of thought, Indian art has been a creative masterpiece and has captured the aesthetic beauty of the land and continues to attract the onlookers. Thank you.